Hi there, it's me, Brandon, the geology guy. Welcome back. If you've been following my videos so far, then you know that in terms of talking about melting rock, we so far talked about the mantle melting at a few specific locations in the earth. Divergent plate boundaries, at hot spots over mantle plumes, and at subduction zones. The mantle is mostly made out of a rock called peridotite. If peridotite completely melts, it has a composition we call ultramafic. That's just a fancy term that refers to a whole range of chemical compositions, but basically it has lots of iron and magnesium in it that form the minerals olivine as well as some dark minerals like pyroxene and plagioclase. But mantle peridotite rock rarely completely melts. It usually partially melts. Now, when I say partial melt, I don't mean that only a portion of the mantle is melting. We already know that. What I mean is that for a given chunk of peridotite, only part of that chunk will melt. Now usually when we talk about melting and we think about things melting, we think about ice melting in, into water because that's what we're familiar with. Ice though is homogeneous, meaning it's the same all throughout. You take a chunk of ice, no matter what part of ice you look at, except for a few minor impurities, it's all H2O. So when ice melts, it doesn't go through a partial melt like I'm talking about, it completely melts. Rock, on the other hand, is heterogeneous, meaning it's not the same throughout. It's composed of a wide range of minerals that melt at different points, at different temperatures. So when some of the minerals melt within the rock, some of them stay solid. That's partial melting. Let's do an experiment to show you what I mean. So in this experiment, I've chopped up some crayons into small pieces as well as some hot glue sticks, and I've mixed in some chocolate chips. Now all of these have different melting points. The crayons and the chocolate chips actually have pretty similar melting points, so they actually kind of melted at the same time, which is not what I was hoping would happen. But as this progresses, you can see that the crayons and the chocolate chips melt, and the temperature in here in the bowl there is about, I think it's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they're all melting, but the hot glue is not. It's getting soft, but not quite melting. And so this is an example of partial melting. Now here I'm separating the hot glue out from the molten crayon and chocolate. This is representing uh, what would happen in the crust as the melt squeezes upward and, and rises up through the crust, leaving some minerals behind. Now I'm going to put the hot glue pieces back into the bowl and heat up the temperature to about 180 degrees and then you can see that it really does melt once it gets hot enough. Now when peridotite, the rock that makes up the mantle, partially melts, its composition evolves from ultramafic to mafic. Some of the minerals that are in the peridotite don't melt. When the magma pushes upward, it leaves the solid minerals behind, taking only the portion that, that melted. So now the mafic magma has a different mix of elements in it than the peridotite had. Now not all mafic magmas are exactly the same. They have different concentrations of the elements that they have within them. So really, mafic composition, in fact all of these different composition groups that we're talking about are really just that. They're groups or ranges of compositions. Now I want to take a second to explain the chart that you saw on my computer monitor. This chart shows the generalized full range of mineral compositions in the different magma groups. Under the chart are some close-up photos of actual extrusive and intrusive rock samples in each group. So starting with the far right, we're looking at the ultramafic group which is mostly made of olivine, but also has some pyroxene minerals and can have calcium-rich plagioclase. Olivine is a green mineral, but pyroxene and calcium plagioclase are pretty dark, giving ultramafic rocks a dark green color. Next we see the range of minerals within mafic magma and rocks. Still some olivine, but not nearly as much as in the ultramafic group. Still pyroxene, and even more calcium plagioclase. Since mafic rocks don't have as much olivine, they are typically the darkest igneous rocks. The intermediate group still has some pyroxene, but the plagioclase is evolving to have less calcium and more sodium, making it lighter in color. Depending on the mixture, intermediate rocks can have amphibole, biotite, quartz, and even some potassium feldspar. Intermediate igneous rocks then are lighter than mafic ones, either appearing gray or having a 50-50 mixture of black and white. Finally, there's the felsic group, which has even more sodium in the plagioclase, 
has almost no pyroxene and has amphibole biotite quartz and can have much more potassium feldspar. The felsic rocks tend to be very light in color, but not always. Okay, looking again at the chart as a whole, I hope you can see how each group is a range of compositions. Okay, so if different minerals have different melting points, then by definition, that means they also have different crystallizing points. So as the magma cools and crystallizes, some minerals will begin crystallizing sooner than others. This is a process we call fractional crystallization. And when that happens, the minerals that crystallize in the melt tend to settle at the bottom. And now the melted part of the magma has a different composition than mafic. It evolved yet again, this time from mafic to intermediate. And this can happen yet again to one final group we call felsic. So, quick recap so far. The mantle is mostly made of a rock called pritatite that rarely completely melts. It partially melts, meaning only some of the minerals within the pritatite melt, leaving the others behind. This causes it to evolve from ultramafic to mafic. And then through fractional crystallization, as the magma begins to cool, not all of the crystals form all at once, and those that do settle to the bottom, causing the mafic magma to evolve into an intermediate, and as this happens again, then the intermediate magma then evolves into a felsic magma. Okay, now so here's some things to keep in mind. The different compositions of magma don't just play a role in how the rock looks, but some other physical characteristics of the magma and how it behaves. So. The more felsic the magma, the more towards the felsic end of composition a magma is, the more viscous it is, the higher its viscosity. Now, viscosity is a technical word that means resistance to flow. So think of honey. Honey has a higher viscosity than water because it's thicker and it doesn't flow as easily. Magmas that are more felsic are more viscous. They have a higher viscosity. That means they are thicker and don't flow as easily. A higher viscosity means that because they don't flow as well, they tend to create more explosive eruptions because they trap so much of the pressure that's building in a magma chamber over a much longer period of time, and they also contain lots of volatiles in them usually, water, carbon dioxide, sulfuric acid, things that cause so much pressure to build up that when it finally does erupt, there's so much pressure it erupts explosively. This is why eruptions that happen in Hawaii are usually more calm and non-explosive, especially compared to eruptions like the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980. Hawaii's lava is mafic, whereas Mount St. Helens lava is intermediate and sometimes felsic. Also, the more felsic the magma, usually the cooler it is. Remember, as I said, the magma is cooling off and so minerals crystallize sooner than others. Therefore, as the magma evolves as it's cooling through fractional crystallization, the more felsic it becomes. So therefore, typically, a felsic magma is a cooler magma than mafic ones. Hawaii's lava, which is mafic, when it erupts, is about 1200 degrees Celsius, which is about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that against the lava that's erupting out of Mount St. Helens currently, which is about 800 degrees Celsius or about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Still hot, but not as hot as the mafic magma that's coming out of Hawaii. One last thing, the more felsic the rock is, typically the lighter color, the igneous rock that forms from it. Ultra mafic rocks are usually a dark green. Mafic rocks are usually a black or a really dark gray. Intermediate are a little bit lighter of a gray. And felsic rocks can be white, gray, or creamy colored, depending on the mix of the minerals that they have in them. Okay, so that's a quick overview of how magma evolves to form different compositions from ultramafic to mafic, then from mafic to intermediate, and from intermediate to felsic. Now we're gonna use these compositions in identifying our igneous rocks. This is really helpful because as you identify a particular igneous rock, you can immediately know something about how that rock was formed. I'm the Geology Guy, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.